10 months. I go, no, I'm coming back. So then they finally gave me a contract because I told them, hey, listen, I was on top of the world with you guys. I was doing good. Get, get me back to Stockton. You know, let me come back on the roster and see what I can do. You know, and they, they fought a little bit. You know, then he finally said yes, and they called me. I was out of here. So they report to Stockton in two days. You know, and uh, I reported there in like June of um, 82. So almost not even still, not a year, 11 months. So I get there and I'm on the D DL there, injury reverse, till so they get the approval, and then they approve me. I'm gonna I'm playing my first game against the Giants, Bill Bordley, the guy with the USC feed on. And with the Giants, he was coming back for um, a rehabilitation start. He's in the bigs, he came to single A, and he's playing there, and then that's incredible. They they heard about this too. You know, it's just a lot a lot of things going on. They wanted to film the three days of me and my comeback game, and so every a lot of things were going on. So here I am, you know, I'm kind of moving forward too much here, but that's well. How how did that come about? So you're 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 on the injured reserve or DL or whatever yeah. they're calling it, and um, were you just kind of out there? Kind of showing the the, the Stockton coaches like well, I'm, I'm, he was my same coach I had the I'm year back. before. Yeah, oh yeah, they knew I was on. I was uniform, taking batting practice, and when they thought I was ready to compete, ready to play, then he was. In, and they wanted to, they wanted to spot start me uh, against left hander. Mm -hmm. I'm hitting right, so it's easier to pick up the ball left. So I went from an everyday player and kind of uh, you know pretty good damn ball player to now you know I'm back. It's a miracle just to be anything. <laughs> But now I'm playing once every four or five days, you know. So, but, but they, they waited for the right time, and Bill was coming. The San Diego Chicken was in town for the big 12,000 people. It's going to be on a Saturday night, and he tells me uh, Saturday morning, you're starting tonight. And the That's Incredible film crew was mad and told our manager, we need another camera. Like, Can you wait? And no. And he, you know, he said, I don't care about your, you know. So they got somebody else from colloquially had two cameramen, like six people going around, take, you know. And I'm, I got a camera in my face, you know. And we're gonna, I'm gonna start seven p.m. in a, as a DH that night. So how did, how did the, so for for people who are a lot young, younger than both you and I, yeah. there was a TV show in the '80s right. uh, that was hosted by four or five people. Uh, yeah. Kathy Lee Crosby, uh, John Davidson, Frank uh, Fran Tarkenton. Who, That's right. You know, uh, so they they would do these human interest stories. There was another TV show called like Real People, yeah, and right. That's Incredible was kind of like uh, this human interest right. story where they would do vignettes about uh, incredible things, good you know, stories. His, you know, great great kind of human interest stories. So how did somebody did somebody contact? Me. That's incredible. You reached out no, to no, them? No, they, no, they called me. Oh, so the, how, how did they get alerted oh, to um, some guy in, yeah. you know, single I, well, A ball playing when, California? When I like, was, well, to back, I back up three, four months when I was coaching at Garner High School in March of 82, I got a note when I got to school um, to call Glenn Kirschbaum, ABC. I thought it was a joke, you know, like somebody's screwing with me. Right? That's an incredible show. So I go, and it was like the top for three years. That was like number one show on, on TV. And um, I call it. And what, what happened is my comeback before that, I got Scott Osler was a famous writer for the LA Times and did a big sports comeback story on me when I was in spring training. So that was the Times. It got to everybody. So that's he, this guy from Vast Incredible Studios. He calls me in March, says, hey, we'd like to have your story. I go, well, yeah, I understand you're thinking about coming back. If you do, we want to be there. And film that. So that was going March, April, May, all the way from the time when I was, um, hey, I'm going to Stockton, Glenn. Okay, we'll have a full crew come there three days earlier and set up the situation to see. Okay, but I don't know when I'm going to play. He goes, okay, you have an idea? I go, no. So they came to just, you know, they have to do their own, what do they do for the studio? And then two days later, the guy, you know, my coach tells me I'm playing. So then I tell them, and they're there, like, you know, we have, you know my God, game on. So... That's how that all transpired. Good evening, I'm John Davidson, and you've got an incredible hour ahead of you with stories like these. I'm Fran Tarkin. <laughs> Courage comes in many forms. Sam Favada had a promising baseball career ahead of him, but it was cut short when he was hit by a pitch. Tonight, the story of his incredible comeback. All this and more... Tonight on... 
That's incredible! A professionally pitched baseball usually travels at over 90 miles per hour. A throw with that kind of power can win a game. It also has the potential to do a lot of damage. If you don't believe it, just ask Sam Favada. In the hierarchy of baseball, the Pony Leagues are one of the main stops talented little leaguers make on their way to the big time. In the Pony Leagues of the 70s, there was no second baseman anywhere in the country who showed more promise than teenager Sam Favada. I started off when I was eight years old as a kid, and I, that was the only thing really I loved to do. And Sam's parents, seeing his talent, backed him all the way. Hey, I just couldn't believe it, the way he, he played ball every day. He loved it, and, and that's what he really lived for, to be a professional ball player. I've never been able, been, a, been around people that had such a, a desire, just a, a, just a, a tremendous inside that's, uh, for the baseball. That's all he ever wanted to do. Sam had not only learned to feel like a pro, but to run and hit with the best of them. The local press kept a steady eye on this All-American, and on graduation, the Dodgers offered to draft him for their farm team. However, Sam opted for a college education and entered California State College at Fullerton to become the star player of their team, the Titans. I was a leading hitter in the, in the, um, the, on the team. I had the most hits in the nation. I was second in stolen bases. I st scored the winning run in the World Series, which was uh, probably the biggest thrill in my whole life to win that World Series game against Arkansas in 1979. It was in that series that Sam first showed the winning pattern that was to become his trademark. He hit a line drive to put himself on first, then proceeded to steal second, steal third, and finally, on a sacrifice fly, he tagged up and scored. When the Titans won the series, Sam was their hands-down hero, and then it was on to bigger things. I got drafted in 1980 by the Milwaukee Brewers. His farm club was the Mudville Ports, an A-team of the Brewers organization. And from the first, 21-year-old Sam gave them his best winning form. They told me, Milwaukee, that I was a prospect, and all I had to do is hit 280 and steal 80 bases a year and play good defense, and I have a chance to be in the big league someday. Sam had already stolen 52 of those 80 bases by July 6, 1981. But that night's game was to change his life. Well, I was leading off the game against Modesto, and the night before that, I got four hits against Modesto, so I was hot. It was strike one on the first pitch, but Sam sensed he had a hit coming on. I let off, and it was 0-2, and I heard the catcher say, you know, don't give him anything good. The pitcher prepared to wind up for Sam's weakness, an inside fastball. Then disaster struck. The ball came high and way inside. Sam ducked, but too late. The instant Sam came to, he began struggling to get up, but his body would not respond. Sam started to say, I'm okay and I want it. And at that point, his voice stopped completely. It was frightening because uh, he sounded like a little child, you know, trying to speak his first word. An ambulance rushed Sam to the Modesto Doctor's Hospital for emergency treatment. Although it's not uncommon for batters to get struck by a ball, doctors feared the pitch that had shattered Sam's helmet had done the same to his skull. Unfortunately, CAT scans proved that they were right. The blood pocket on Sam's brain looked minimal at first, and doctors hoped it might reabsorb overnight. But that was not to be. Well, that next morning I woke up about 6 o'clock and phoned the hospital, and uh, they informed me that uh, they were going to have to operate on him at, I think, at 8.30. New CAT scans showed a horrifying development. Overnight, the one superficial clot had turned into three. Uh, at first, it was that uh, Sammy's going to, you know, he's going to be all right, and then it got to the point where we don't know if Sammy's going to make it. All I cared for in his dad was give him back to us, just let him be, be, our, be there, be alive. We, I really didn't care how, how he would be as long as he, he was alive. I'm sorry. <laughs> Sam did stay alive, but just barely. At first, he was unable to speak or walk and had no control on his right side. But Sam began to fight, and in two weeks, he had recovered his voice enough to make this recording. On July 5th is when I hit, hit right in the head and messed up the B. 
They were very doubtful at the time that he was going to be able to function normally uh, just as a human being. But no one had reckoned on Sam's iron will. In occupational therapy, he pushed himself so relentlessly that within a few months he had made progress that should have taken several years. Sam was not going to let this get, get him down, and he was determined that he was going to go back to play baseball. About three months later, after I got out of the hospital, that's when I started thinking about my career, and maybe there was a chance. You know, I, I never ever said to myself, though, I would never play again. I thought there would be a chance, but time, I took one day at a time. From a physician standpoint, uh, we primarily have to explain to Sam, as we would to any patient, what the risks are. The main area that we want to protect is above your ear, which is the place where a flush impact would do the most damage. And so we put this pad on. Uh, this is actually uh, two layers of 3 8 inch cushion flex. I worked out at Cal State Fullerton where I went to college baseball at, and um, I just went slow because I knew that the doctors say, do whatever you feel you can do, but don't overdo it. So I took it really slow, and I think the biggest part of my comeback was mentally. Nine months after his accident, Sam shocked everyone by showing up at spring training. Only one year and 11 days after being felt at the plate, he was back in the lineup. Well, Milwaukee at the beginning, you know, they were all for me. They've been great to me. You know, they really made me feel like they really cared about me, and that was something that made me feel really good. But when I started thinking about coming to spring training, they at first thought I would just be coming to help maybe just to be around in the atmosphere, but I showed up to play. It took him months to be able to say his name and to be out on a baseball field and to be competing at this level again uh, is taking more courage than most of us will, will ever you know, know in our lifetime. I'd classify it a miracle that, that he's going to play a baseball game tonight. It's midseason again, and the reports are on a devastating five-game losing streak. Coach Espy is hoping that letting Sam try a comeback will boost the team's sagging morale. time on that's incredible good night how was that with the san diego chicken is there and there's twelve thousand people and then now you've got a tv crew for pretty much the number one tv show in the nation it was oh my god it was it was we're talking about i mean that was pressure i mean i just feel like what's going you know i enjoyed it who's not going to like that intention i mean i mean not that i was craving it but it was nice to have people you know, wanting my story and caring about me, and and um, you know, I but I had to focus. He was back to the lessons as a seventeen with Augie. Got to be focused. Distractions. Don't get distracted. See, I mean, little things that I learned five, six years earlier. Here I am. It's happening again. So I was just trying to, you know, I couldn't wait for the game to start because being filmed playing catch and you know, my stuff. You know, I mean, it just you know. Let's go. I'm as nine. I just want to get to the field. I want. I want nothing around, you know. But then when it happened, and I'm hitting six that night, and I was going to lead off the inning.